Good evening. Welcome to the Shrewsbury Public Library. Today's lecture is a continuation of our ongoing series of talks on social justice related topics. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor John Bell, Assistant Professor of History at Assumption University in Worcester. His research examines the intersecting histories of race, education, and social reform in 19th century America. Today, his, he's going to focus on the life and lessons of pioneering educator, Fanny Jackson Coppin. Welcome, Professor Bell. Please take over. Well, thank you very much, Priya, and, uh, and to everyone at the Shrewsbury Library for this kind invitation uh, to uh, present to you this evening um, some items from my research. Um, it is a presentation, but I'm also very much looking forward to the Q&A afterward, and I'm going to try to allot a good amount of time for that. So please be you know, jotting down questions, and um, I look forward to answering them as best I can, or just comments even um, would be great. Uh, thank you all very much for, for tuning in. Um, you know, I, I've been familiar with the series uh, for a while because some of my colleagues have made excellent presentations as uh, part of it. And I understand from Priya that it was uh, started in the wake of uh, George Floyd's killing last summer. And of course, this evening is no ordinary evening because we gather now at, at one of the, I shouldn't say the culmination of that, but certainly at a pivotal, another pivotal moment in that uh, tragic saga. Um, I saw that a Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison responding to Derek Chauvin's conviction this evening uh, said, quote, the work of our generation is to put an end to the vestiges of Jim Crow and the centuries of trauma and finally put an end to racism. And I think that often when we think about... Uh, well, I'm going to try to get a pop to take the phone. Uh, I think, sorry, I think often when we think about... Um, the um, the struggle against racism in this country, we often think about it, or most often think about it uh, of late as an issue to deal with um, criminal justice reform, which is absolutely a, a critical part of it. But, you know, um, a systemic problem like racism has a way of infecting so many of our institutions beyond simply uh, the um, beyond simply law enforcement or our prison system. Uh, it's something that is endemic to uh, all kinds of spheres, uh, including the sphere of education, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. And I'm going to talk about an important figure from the Jim Crow era who in that time did her part to, um, to combat, um, combat that, uh, that institution and uh, create a new future uh, as best she could for herself and also for uh, her people. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and take you to a, a, a PowerPoint. Uh, so I'm going to give that a shot here. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Great. Um, so uh, as you know, uh, the subject of my talk tonight is Fanny Jackson Coppin, which may not be a name that is uh, a household name necessarily, but I don't think it'll take me too long uh, to convince you that she was an extraordinary public figure, eminently deserving of recognition and really a hero for uh, racial justice in the United States. As this historical marker in Philadelphia says, she was a pioneering educator, a writer, a humanist, and a missionary. She was, uh, among her many accomplishments, the second African-American woman to earn a bachelor's degree in the United States, uh, one of the first black women hired to teach, at a racially, to teach a racially integrated class at any level, uh, the very first black woman to become a school principal, a position which she held for over 30 years. She was a sought after author and orator, uh, one of the featured speakers at the World's Congress of Representative Women held in Chicago in 1893 in conjunction with the famous World's Fair that year. She became a missionary to South Africa at the age of 65. Uh, she returned to the United States in 1906 and died in 1913. And in 1926, ba Baltimore's Black Teachers College was renamed in her honor and is now Coppin State University to this day. So I'm speaking tonight about Fanny Jackson Coppin's life from a place of admiration, uh, firstly, 
um, both as a historian, but also in particular as a fellow educator. Uh, she uh, definitely brought more grace to the teaching of adolescents than I ever did as a high school teacher. Uh, and her compassion for her students and her belief in their abilities really reminds me of some of the best teachers that I've ever known and had as a student. Um, I've studied her life and circumstances closely, but, uh, and along with the movements and institutions that she was uh, a part of, which are actually uh, the subject of my larger um, book project, which I could talk about in the Q and A. Um, but, you know, I wanna stress at the onset that while I'm speaking about her life uh, from a place of knowledge, you know, as a historian, uh, but I'm also speaking about her life from a place of limited understanding. Um, my comprehension of her experience is necessarily incomplete. We were born almost 150 years apart. Uh, and while I was born white, male, and comfortably middle class, she was born black, female, and enslaved. And so I think that when it comes to interpreting a life that's so far removed from one's own, it's important to approach the task with some humility. Uh, I'm a historian of black education, but I have never experienced the challenges of teaching while black as the title of this, um, uh, to quote the title of this talk. So what I'm offering today are interpretations of Fanny Jackson Coppin's life and writings. Uh, but I hope that this talk sparks your curiosity and enough to uh, examine her biography for yourself and to form some of your own conclusions. That, after all, is the business of history, uh, not simply to learn facts about the past, but to search for meaning in times gone by. So I have two goals with tonight's talk. Uh, the first is to put Fanny Jackson Coppin's life in context so that we can understand the significance of her achievements in her lifetime. But the second is to draw lessons from her life and writings that we might uh, apply to our own lives today that might be useful to us today. So I wanna begin by talking a little bit about her uh, early life. Uh, she was born into slavery in 1837 in Washington, DC. She was the daughter of an enslaved woman and purportedly a Senator from the Carolinas. Um, her aunt, a free black woman who earned $6 a month, saved $125 to buy Fanny's freedom and move her to New England as, a, uh, as an adolescent. And at 14, she found work as a maid in the household of George and Elizabeth Calvert, one of the elite families of Newport, Rhode Island. Serving in uh, serving an upper class family taught Jackson uh, the, the mores of high society. She learned to sew, she learned to play piano and so on. The Calverts also gave her time off for primary schooling and supported her education at the Rhode Island School, uh, the Rhode Island Normal School for Teachers, which is a teacher's college now Rhode Island State University. Her love of learning, however, made her hunger for more. So here's a picture of uh, Fanny Jackson around this time. Um, she set her sights higher. In fact, she set her sights uh, on something that no black woman up to that time had achieved, uh, earning a bachelor's degree. And in 1860, she enrolled at the only college in America where it was possible to do that, the Ober Oberlin College located in uh, Northeastern Ohio. Here's a picture of the campus from around that time. So Oberlin was the first college in American history to admit students irrespective of both sex and race beginning in the 1830s. And it inspired uh, the founding of a number of other abolitionist colleges, which um, uh, is the focus of my uh, forthcoming book. The goal of these experiments in racial co-education was really twofold. First, to demonstrate the fitness of African Americans for freedom and full citizenship. And then second, to illustrate the possibilities of racial pluralism in American society. Here's a picture of some Oberlin students from 1855. I would defy you to find any picture like this from any archive, any American archive of, of uh, collecting materials from that period. This is really an extraordinary image to see uh, black and white youth, men and women, um, they're in such close, um, intimate proximity. Um, and interracial camaraderie uh, was commonplace on uh, abolitionist college campuses in this era, in the sort of general Civil War era. Black and white students attended the same classes, they prayed in the same chapel, they ate in the same dining hall, even on some occasions they did each other's laundry. And African Americans joined clubs, organized events, earned degrees, just like their white peers. But I should stress 
and I want to uh, be clear about this, these campuses were never colorblind uh, utopias. If you look at even this picture a little more closely, you'll see that there's actually only one instance, at least only one that I can find, uh, where a black and a white student touch. And it's not exactly a fond embrace. So uh, I may be overreading here, but uh, as I look at this, it's a reminder to me and a reminder of other sources uh, that I've read and found that so often white students arrived at these institutions uh, with their prejudices in tow. Um, we have to remember that most white Americans uh, at a place like this uh, had never interacted with African Americans on terms of equality or maybe even at all. Um, so they had to learn to respect and learn to affiliate with their uh, black peers. So uh, Fanny Jackson was entering this environment as a young woman uh, and her experience at Oberlin uh, as a college student highlighted these gaps, I think, between principal and, and practice. She was one of the few African-Americans enrolled in the uh, collegiate program, that is the bachelor's degree program. Oberlin had a separate program, which they called the ladies course, which was a, um, had many, featured many of the same classes, but not quite all the same. So the, the graduates of that did not actually earn a bachelor's degree, but earned a ladies certificate. Um, so it was a very gendered kind of division of knowledge there. Um, when Fanny Jackson enrolled at Oberlin uh, in, in the collegiate program, she was one of only three black women uh, enrolled very few African Americans in general, but only three black women, uh, including uh, this woman who actually preceded her in earning the bachelor's degree. This is Mary Jane Patterson, uh, another important figure in African American history in this time period. She is the first African American woman to earn a bachelor's degree at any um, at any American college. Um, so Oberlin maintained a colorblind standard and impartial standard, but uh, it, for Jackson's experience, that standard did not always assuage the isolation she felt as a woman of color in an overwhelmingly white setting. As she put it, quote, I never rose to recite in my classes at Oberlin, but I felt that I had the honor of the whole African race upon my shoulders. I felt that should I fail, it would be ascribed to the fact that I was colored. So for most of her college career, uh, Jackson boarded uh, with several white classmates in the household of a professor, which was a pretty common practice in the 19th century. Uh, and she felt in that household that she was treated, uh, in her words, like a member of the family. But the subject of race was generally avoided, which made it hard for her to voice uh, her unique struggles. Eventually, one housemate asked Jackson if she had ever been a slave, kind of casually asked her that. And when Jackson replied that she, in fact, had, uh, this woman burst into tears. Her question had exposed an uncomfortable truth, I think. Despite their ostensible equality, Jackson had suffered in ways that her white classmates had not. And Jackson recalled, not another word was spoken by us, but those tears seemed to wipe out a little of what was wrong. And I think what she means here by what was wrong was that there was a problem of recognition. Jackson wanted to be accepted out discount, discounting race. She also appreciated opportunities to spend time with other black Oberlinites. In particular, she valued the sort of open door policy of Caroline and John Mercer Langston, who lived across the street from the house where she boarded. Uh, since graduating from Oberlin in 1849, John Langston on the left had become the first African American admitted to the Ohio bar as well as the first uh, African-American in the nation elected to public office when he was voted Oberlin town clerk just a few years uh, prior. Uh, Langston went on to become the, the first dean of Howard Law School and uh, for a brief period, a congressman from Virginia. He and his wife, Caroline, who was a graduate of Oberlin's ladies course, remember the pressures they had faced as students and they opened their parlor as a place of refuge for black youth studying at Oberlin. So with a robust support system in place, um, Jackson was able to excel at her studies. And in 1863, she became the first person of color appointed to teach in Oberlin's secondary school. Uh, so Oberlin, like most colleges in the 19th century, um, the 
the number of students who are studying for a bachelor's degree was actually quite small, uh, and the much larger, the vast majority of students were actually enrolled in what we would think of as more of a high school curriculum, they called it a preparatory school. Um, so every year, the college hired about 40 undergraduates to teach in this preparatory program. And uh, Jackson was hired in 1863, the first person of color uh, hired for one of these positions. I should note that in 1853, so 10 years prior, the school's trustees had tabled a petition from uh, members of the community advocating for the appointment of an African American to a, a teaching position at Oberlin. And at the time, the trustees had said that, quote, in the choice of professors and teachers of all grades, we are governed by intrinsic merit, irrespective of color. However, over the next decade, so from 53 to 63, the faculty passed up, by my count, 11 eligible Black undergraduates for instructor positions. And Fanny Jackson herself said, quote, there was an old custom of giving classes only to white students. So she was really breaking barriers here. Um, why uh, was she the one uh, chosen? I think partly it had to do with her qualifications. Uh, normal school training, that is teacher training in Rhode Island had made her better prepared than most of her classmates, black or white, to assume teaching responsibilities. And having worked in that elite household, uh, the Calverts had taught her the standards of genteel refinement. And that really mattered because her character as a black woman who and black women were easily the most a disparaged group of people in American society at the time, her character had to be completely unimpeachable to counteract any stereotypes of Black women's degeneracy. So uh, I think that uh, played a role here. The other thing to remember here is the timing. So 1863, January 1st, 1863 was when President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And so her appointment to this position is coming on the heels of that at a moment when the kind of optimism or enthusiasm for social transformation in the country was at an all-time high. Uh, Jackson felt honored to be selected for this position, uh, but administrators warned her that if her pupils, quote, rebelled, she may have to step aside. So it was always a contingent position that she was in. Uh, in the 19th century, African-Americans almost never taught white students, like not only before this, but also after this. I can only find one potential instance before this, and I'm not even sure that that teacher taught an integrated class of students. So it's possible that Fanny Jackson, the first African-American to teach in a formal setting, uh, white students. And there were very few other examples of this uh, later on in the century. Uh, I'd like to pause here and kind of compare that circumstance to uh, classrooms today for a second. So I'm gonna jump all the way to now for a moment. Because uh, I, want, I want us to think here about you know, how different or how similar is that circumstance for to, from today. African-Americans today represent 13% of the American population, but they account for only 7% of public school teachers and only 3% of private school teachers. And these, this, uh, this gap in representation is also present amongst Latinos. So uh, Latinos represent 18% of the US population, but only 8% of public school teachers and only 7% of private school teachers. And uh, the statistics uh, at the college level are even worse. So um, only about 6% of college faculty in the United States today are black and only about 6% are Hispanic. What does this mean? It means that the odds of any American student today uh, having a teacher or professor of color are pretty low. Um, young people grow up rarely seeing people of color in positions of intellectual authority in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and now in the 21st century. So we could ask ourselves, and maybe we could talk about this more in the Q&A, what does this mean for students of color today? And also, what does this mean for white students today, um, not having that uh, exposure to um, people of color in these roles? So if having a black teacher is unusual now, it was completely unheard of in 1863. In fact, one of Fanny Jackson's uh, students, white students, threatened to leave Oberlin when he learned that, quote, his teacher was a woman and a black woman at that. Jackson's passion and her um, pedagogical training helped counteract any misgivings, however. Her classes soon became some of the most popular in the school. The same bigoted white student purportedly grew to quote, prefer Miss Jackson to any other teacher. Uh, her enrollment um, 
swelled to uh, 80 students in the single class, which prompted the administration to split it into two. Uh, and visitors to Oberlin made a point of sitting in on uh, her classes uh, to observe this um, very unusual phenomenon. So uh, Fanny Jackson really relished her instructorship, but she took special pride actually in a different teaching position she held while at Oberlin. Her senior year, she helped organize an evening school for the town's black residents, many of whom had recently escaped slavery. She wrote later, quote, it was deeply moving to me to see old men painfully following the simple words of spelling, so intensely eager to learn. I felt that for such people to have been kept in the darkness of ignorance was an unpardonable sin. And I rejoiced that even then I could enter measurably upon the course in life which I had so long ago chosen, namely to become an educator. So this experience of teaching uh, recently, um, recently enslaved people uh, really reaffirmed her commitment, not simply to teaching, but to teaching her own people. And having been born into bondage, she really knew the power of education to uplift and to empower. She uh, became the second black woman in American history to earn a bachelor's degree when she graduated in 1865, and it was that year that she uh, took on her first uh, full-time teaching position um, at the a school called the Institute for Colored Youth in Philadelphia. Oberlin uh, leaders had recommended her for this role. The ICW was the premier uh, junior college and secondary school, or one of the premier junior colleges and secondary schools for African-Americans uh, at the time. And after just a year in her teaching role, she was made supervisor of its ladies department, I guess we could say sort of like Dean of Women. Um, in 1869, so just four years into her time there, uh, the principal of the Institute was appointed ambassador to Haiti by President Grant. And so the school's board of managers needed to find a new principal and they chose uh, Fanny Jackson to replace him. That appointment made her the first African-American woman to become a school principal uh, in American history. And so she remained in that job from the year she was employed in 1869 until 1902, uh, a remarkable, a remarkably long tenure. She became a fixture of the Philadelphia community in that time, uh, and also one of the nation's most renowned black educators and activists. As I said, this tenure uh, of of 33 years was was incredible. And uh, it's made more incredible by the fact that she got married in 1881, um, much later than most women at the time got married. She was in her 40s by that point. Uh, and she still maintained her position as principal of the Institute, which is something that most married women, in fact, even her husband uh, did not uh, want her to do, discouraged her from doing. Uh, but she was uh, committed to this role. And in fact, they lived apart for four years while he passed her to church in uh, Baltimore. He was a minister um, before he returned and they could live together in Philadelphia by 1885. So um, it's just another demonstration of just how deep this uh, woman's commitment was to her calling. Um, we should also note her innovations as principal. So one of the things that she did as soon as she could was to abolish tuition uh, so as to encourage poor students to enroll at the school. She was especially concerned for the plight of, of recently arrived Black Southerners uh, who had immigrated to, to Philadelphia from the South and were uh, frequent victims of discrimination, not only uh, from white Philadelphians, but also within Philadelphia's Black community. Caring for the vulnerable was really a hallmark of Fannie Jackson's leadership. She served on the board of managers for the Home for the Aged and Infirmed Colored People of Philadelphia for over 20 years. And she also founded a settlement house for single women in 1894. As principal, she also expanded the Institute's curricular offering. So here's some images of uh, students at the Institute participating in some of those programs. Uh, she created a teacher training program and she also created a trade school as part of the ICW. Um, you may remember or, or have heard from other sources that in the late 19th century, there was a really vigorous debate uh, amongst African-American educators as to whether classical or liberal arts education or industrial or what we might call uh, technical education was the best means of uh, empowering or to use their word, uplifting uh, the race. So this debate famously played out between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington 
But actually, uh, Fanny Jackson was also uh, one of the first uh, people to uh, really be tackling this question because she was in a position uh, to do so as principal of the Institute. Um, in fact, the, the same year that Booker T. Washington started the industrial education program at Tuskegee, um, Jackson started her um, trade school at uh, the Institute. Now, that debate is often framed as one side versus the other um, and a pretty fierce division. But uh, from Jackson Coppin's way of doing things, I'll start calling her Jackson Coppin now that she's uh, married to, to Levi Coppin. Uh, she believed that racial uplift required economic independence. So any form of training, professional, technical, classical, otherwise, uh, that would achieve that end of empowerment, that's what she wanted to support. And as principal, she organized oratorical and mechanical exhibitions to showcase her students' abilities and help them find work in whatever field they chose to pursue. So all of this work, all of this effort, along with her public speeches and her published writings, made Fanny Jackson Coppin something of a legend in her own time, uh, especially among Black women. And I just wanted to share this one example, which I, I really like. In 1899, a group of Black, ba Black Baptist women in Oakland, California, so on the complete other side of the country, um, started a Fanny Jackson Coppin Club, which became the first of many women's clubs in California. Uh, black women's clubs in California. Uh, they were inspired by Jackson Coppin's work in Philadelphia, uh, and they started providing many of the th same things that she had provided there, essential community services like uh, housing assistance, tutoring services, uh, various forms of uh, cultural exhibitions and things of that nature. Their motto, I don't know if you can see it here on this line, but their motto here was, uh, not failure, but low aim is the crime, which uh, I think was a fitting tribute to Jackson Coppin and her really boundless uh, personal ambition. So what I would consider to be Fanny Jackson Coppin's uh, sort of uh, capstone act of service was the publication of her memoir, which is called Reminiscences of School Life and Hints on Teaching. Um, and that's actually the URL if you want to, you can read it for free online and I can share that uh, later on. Uh, but it's, def it's a fascinating read and I'm going to draw a lot of the rest of the talk from that text. Uh, she completed this book uh, only a few months before she died in 1913. Um, as the title suggests, the book combines aspects of autobiography and also of uh, pedagogy, that is the science of teaching. We know much more about Jackson's life than most 19th century black women because she published this memoir. Uh, and we also know much more about her methods as a in her classroom than we do uh, of most black educators from that time period, thanks to this, uh, this book. So I'm going to spend the re remainder of the talk analyzing how her life experiences influence the teaching philosophy that she uh, articulates here. Um, and I think actually you'll find that her educational principles remain remarkably relevant. And actually, as someone who's teaching right now in a hybrid environment, uh, I find them especially relevant during the pandemic. So I'm, I'm going to divide these into six lessons. This is sort of a synthesis of what she, she's saying here. So these are my six um, sort of categories here. Uh, first lesson, oh, by the way, I have to comment. Somebody made this wonderful, like Andy Warhol-esque uh, set of pictures of Fanny Jackson Coppin, which I really like. I like it because it suggests that she could be in four places at once, which seemed to be uh, the way she worked sometimes, given all that she achieved. Anyway, uh, four lessons here uh, from this, uh, this book. Uh, first is to get organized. Jackson Coppin's genius as an educator was her knack for organization. Uh, she believed that the teacher's task was to, quote, think out many helpful ways to occupy his pupils to the best advantage while he is with them. So she always began by organizing her students into divisions, almost like a general. Um, large class sizes at Oberlin and afterward accustomed her to accommodating a wide variety of skill levels simultaneously. So she would group pupils by ability in order to keep proficient students from getting bored and struggling ones from getting discouraged. She said, all are kept busy as bees, which I like. Uh, engagement and study limited students' appetite for mischief. Uh, 
And it also created a well-ordered classroom, which eased the disciplinary demands on the teacher. Jackson Coppin believed that educators should, quote, by no means take up a position as if watching the pupils. So she didn't like the idea of surveillance. Um, in her view, high expectations paired with skillful arrangement of their work by the teacher would be enough to instill a sense of responsibility in students. Little by little, she wrote, these young people will acquire the habit of doing what they know is right, whether the teacher sees them or not. So that was lesson one. Lesson two, uh, practice makes proficient. Regardless of their skill level, Jackson Coppin's students spent half to three quarters of their time reviewing pr prior material. Um, in her view, these reviews, uh, these review sessions would be uh, useful in um, providing uh, really essential practice of key concepts. So the reviewing division, uh, half the students would, would review the material, answer problems that she posed pose on the blackboard. The other half of the students would learn the new lesson and then they would switch places um, and correct the work that the other students had done. So these review sessions enabled students to become teachers. Uh, she called this the system of cooperative correction. Uh, it gave them a chance to stand before the class, to identify errors in each other's work, and to instruct their peers. Quote, the pupils will profit by the criticisms of one another, the teacher making no corrections that can possibly be made by the class, thus inviting and stimulating the critical knowledge and or judgment of all. Now, this might seem obvious to us today that, oh, of course, we learn best by doing, but that idea was actually really um, made popular by educational theorists like John Dewey after Fanny Jackson Coppin had been implementing it in her own classroom for decades. Uh, so she's really a pioneering um, uh, uh, pedagogical theorist here too. And you know what someone like Dewey came through, uh, came to through philosophy, um, Jackson Coppin came through just through basic experience. As she put it, if the person is to get the benefit of what we call an education, he must educate himself under the direction of the teacher. Um, this kind of uh, program of review, besides providing an opportunity for peer and self-instruction, which was important to her, also helped absentee students stay up to speed. So um, Jackson Coppin was very concerned about issues of absenteeism uh, for student learning and the implications of absenteeism for student learning. Uh, then, as now, working class children of color were routinely called away from their studies placing them at significant disadvantage, something that's only been exacerbated by the pandemic. And Jackson Coppin argued that because education is an incremental process, this type of routine interruption had a way of undermining intellectual growth. She compared an absent student's academic career to quote, a ladder with a rung out here or there. Instead of the person going up easily or smoothly, he is every now and then distracted by the difficulty of the step. So. Uh, she's concerned that students would, uh, would uh, fall, who fell behind early would struggle to get to those sort of higher levels. They'd be missing the rungs uh, in the ladder. And so she asks in her, uh, in her book, how far are we, that is the teachers, responsible for this condition of affairs? So in her view, this situation of absenteeism made it incumbent on educators to teach what she called the elementary principles underlying each subject, the fundamentals. And then practice that through frequent mental exercise, applying these rules so as to ingrain them in students' minds. She said, every time the review is given, the children learn something new about the subject. In short, remediation was in everyone's interest. Okay, lesson four. Uh, she didn't say this, but it's from a bumper sticker that I like. Uh, humankind be both. Jackson never attributed a student's difficulties to a lack of ability or intelligence. In her view, circumstances were most often to blame for poor performance, not intellect. Disparaging, struggling students, moreover, would only discourage them further. Many a child called dull would advance rapidly under a patient, wise, and skillful teacher, Jackson Coffin explained, and the teacher should be as conscientious in the endeavor to improve himself as he is to improve the child. Here again, she preached reciprocity underscoring instructors duty to their students. When it came to addressing learning difficulties, Jackson Coffin wrote, the teacher ought to think of himself when he was taking his first lessons. So from her own educational struggles, not to mention her enslavement, Jackson knew firsthand what a difference compassion could make. Remember all the time you are dealing with a human being whose needs are like your own, she wrote. 
Perhaps that experience of slavery contributed to Jackson Coppin's aversion to corporal punishment. She knew human's capacity for cruelty, and she believed that vengeance only begat vengeance. Be careful of arousing a spirit of revenge in your pupil, she warned. We should remember that punishments that do not correct harden. True to form, she advised teachers to get to the root of the problem and find the wiser way for correcting the wrong. Lesson five, lead by example. Teachers should look for the best in their students and always model the behaviors that they seek. For Jackson Coppin, the most important discipline for a teacher was self-discipline. Obedience, truthfulness, love of right, and sincerity must be instilled and inculcated by precept and by example, she stressed. Kindness was her cardinal virtue because it repaid itself in kind. A disrespectful student need only be reminded that his teacher has always spoken politely to him and the case is won without any more argument. A child might even apologize on his own volition when he recognized he had not reciprocated the kindness of his teacher. As with any other form of teaching, students had to see the right if they were to do the right. And teacher's challenge, te uh, teacher's challenge was to be patient in that process, trusting in their pupils' potential for growth. And finally, lesson six, keep the faith. The watchword of Fanny Jackson Coppin's pedagogy was faith. She put equal faith in the wits of youth and in the wisdom of teachers. There is no field more fertile than that of a child's mind, she believed. Yet even the most fruitful soil required diligent cultivation. What we sow, we reap, Jackson Coppin explained. If we plant tomatoes, we get tomatoes. We certainly should not expect to find potatoes. Teacher's duty was to tend young minds as a farmer would a cash crop, ensuring that students' growth was steady and even. The times demanded an abundant harvest of educated African-Americans to combat the blight of Jim Crow. Jackson Coppin was not blind to the injustices of the world her students were entering. Her memoir rails against racial discrimination in the trades and in the professions. Such proscriptions stifled black citizens' economic mobility and impoverished the nation of their talents. African-Americans asked no special favors, Jackson Coppin said, just quote, an open field on which to pursue their ambitions. Given the opportunity, African-Americans would show their worth. So in conclusion, if uh, we were to try to sum up Jackson's uh, work and thought, um, even more succinctly than these, uh, these six lessons. If I could leave you with just one uh, emblem to encapsulate uh, this talk and her life, uh, it would be that biblical symbol of the sea. Fanny Jackson Coppin was a church woman after all, uh, and her favorite parables were the ones about sowers and seeds. More than once in the gospels, Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a kernel of grain full of potential, but beset with obstacles to its growth. Fragile souls, like fragile seeds, need good care to take root and flourish. As an educator of black youth in the late 19th century, Jackson Coppin made it her life's mission to nurture young minds and teach them to blossom amid adversity. The Gospel of Matthew says, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Over the course of her life and work, Fanny Jackson Coppin moved many mountains and sowed many seeds. Her example reminds us that though the challenges confronting educators are and have always been great, teachers make a difference every time they implant a young person with a confidence to succeed. So I will stop there. Thank you for bearing with me there. And uh, I guess Bria will open up for questions. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, John, for introducing us to this remarkable woman. Uh, I must admit that I hadn't heard of Fanny Jackson Coppin. So why do you think her story that, I mean, such a great pioneer, not taught in school? Uh, well, she wouldn't be the only one, uh, <laughs> the only person who's a uh, great person whose story has been uh, overlooked. Um, but uh, I think one encouraging thing that I've seen in talking to educators, particularly younger educators, is a great desire to widen that, call it, canon of, uh, of figures to include um, in, uh, in, that, in that conversation. 
and to uh, to reach beyond the usual suspects and realize that actually so many of these figures are more identifiable to in the to students than uh, or more kind of uh, relatable to students than um, some of the figures that we're more accustomed to seeing uh, in marble and on pedestals. Uh, so I think that um, uh, you know once these these stories are better known, I, I do expect them to to take root because figures like her are are really compelling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's way ahead of her time, right? Absolutely, in, in many ways, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The examples that you mentioned, the pedagogical principles that she followed, her uh, endorsement of peer review, mm -hmm. all these are so remarkable for a person of her time. That's right, that's right. So it looks like somebody has their, their hand up. Should we, um, or should we yes. put, put questions in the chat? Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Yeah, I, don't um, I just wanted to know what inspired you to like um, study her or try and find out more about her. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so uh, this. I discovered her as part of the research for my, my I guess originally my dissertation, and so now it's my going to be my book. Um, and the book is about the first African Americans to study at uh, predominantly white um, colleges, um, which were associated with the abolitionist movement. So Oberlin is one, and then there's two others. Um, from the start, I realized that it was going to be important to tell that story from the perspective of the stu the black students themselves that is not to try to to tell it like um, from the perspective of the institution but to understand how the students lived and moved through that institution and what they learned from that experience what they took from it uh, how they criticized the institution even as they you know applauded the things that it did right uh, so uh, once I found out about her story uh, just the just the basic aspects of it um, it was an easy uh, it was yeah it was, it was uh, I just was hungry to know more um, and I was lucky because as I said we don't have this level of detail on so many um, so many African American lives in general in this period but especially the lives of black women so to be able to have not only, her track record as a student at Oberlin, but also her remarkable track record as a principal and this uh, extraordinary memoir um, meant that I thought, well, she has to be a central character in this story. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's why. Yeah, thank you. Can you see the chat? Uh, yes, I'm just, uh, just pulled that up. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so uh, Gail is asking about the pronoun he. Uh, so yes, she was a 19th century writer, and in the 19th century conventions, when you refer to a single person, you use the pronoun he. Um, I don't think that she would have done that today. Uh, Amber asks, uh, what did you learn about her mission trips? Does, she, does her book speak about her experiences abroad? Uh, it does a bit. Um, I should say that her her husband, who was who became eventually became a bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, his name was uh, Levi Coppin. Um, he also wrote a memoir which talks a lot more in detail about her missionary work in South Africa. Um, she discusses it a bit, but her memoir is mostly focused on her her time in Philadelphia as an educator. Um, but uh, but she um, her husband's. Okay. Uh, someone else asked, was she ever threatened? I guess uh, we mean as a, um, uh, I'm not sure if you, the person means as a, as a teacher or just as a, as a woman of color in uh, uh, a Jim Crow era. Um, I don't know of any instances of her being threatened within her own classroom. I don't do know of instances of her, at least one of her black classmates being threatened and actually assaulted uh, while, during their time. Uh, at Oberlin, which is a really uh, painful and tragic story. Um, I do know that she faced regular forms of discrimination as a black woman in, in Philadelphia um, after leaving Oberlin, um, including you know, being forced off the um, uh, supposedly whites only train cars and things like that. Um, so that kind of experience, is, experience was pretty commonplace. Um, 
And of course she had been enslaved and she doesn't speak a lot about her experience of enslavement, maybe perhaps because it was too painful, perhaps because she was too young to remember too many of the details, but um, I can only imagine, you know, the horrors that, uh, that befell her in that, in that position. Um, there's another question here. Relationships, oh, okay, so asking about this quote here, um, relationships that transcend race, I said, without discounting race. So, um, you know, without ignoring the fact that there was a racial difference there um, was really key to her. So she she didn't want to be uh, thought of as raceless. Uh, she wanted people to understand, and she was proud of uh, who she was and, and who her people were. Um, okay. Um, someone named Carl Kais, a colleague of mine, uh, asks uh, about uh, publication history of reminiscences, uh, multiple editions, um, to what extent do contemporary, contemporaries consult and cite reminiscences. Um, it's interesting, I think this publication, it was published by the, actually by the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, they have a, a publication arm called the Book Concern, um, which also published her husband's memoir later on. Uh, it's, uh, it's a book that I think gained a fair amount of traction among uh, um, what they what used to be called uh, colored women's clubs. Uh, I showed you the, the, the example of the one from, um, from Oakland, California. So I think it circulated there and also in, um, in uh, black church circles. Uh, but beyond that, I, don't, I haven't found much evidence that it, it took on um, you know, any great notice uh, amongst these sort of uh, more familiar names in educational theory and philosophy, like John Dewey, as I mentioned. Um, but, uh, but I do, do suspect, I don't have evidence for this, but I do suspect that certainly in a place like Coppin State, uh, a black uh, teachers college that it would be the kind of kind of uh, receptive audience uh, for that text. Uh, another person asked, "Does Oberlin have a currently honor her in any way?" Uh, she's certainly a well-known name at Oberlin. Um, I'm not sure if there are, you know, like say a scholarship. I don't think that there's a building named after her. Uh, although there's at least one building named after you know one of her classmates. Um, but that is the uh, that's all I know about that. Um, is Overland still a college today? Yes. Uh, and if so, what has changed? Oh boy, uh, you'll have to read my book and find out. <laughs> That's a, quite a, a lengthy question. Um, Overland is a is a still a liberal arts college today. Um, they have continued to have uh, both great achievements and great struggles around issues of race uh, on campus. Um, and uh, um, my book only covers through the early. 20th century, um, but there's been a, a fair amount written uh, even more recently about issues of race on campus there. So um, uh, it, would, it would honestly, it would take too long uh, to explain, but, uh, but yes, it is, uh, it is still around and, um, and it is very proud, justly proud of its uh, legacies uh, in terms of admitting not just African-Americans, but also just women in general uh, as college students. Uh, one of the first colleges to go co-ed uh, in 18, actually from the start in 1833. Uh, um, Tim, who is a student of mine, a student of mine, asks: uh, In the Overland College photograph of white and African American students, there are two students of both races holding hands. Would you say this is an early example of the vision that Martin Luther King uh, envisioned during the Civil Rights Movement? Uh, more specifically, since African Americans were victimized by slavery, lynching, and equality uh, since before the Civil War and throughout Reconstruction and Civil Rights Movement. Was there some equality that was granted to African Americans at these institutions during Fannie Jackson Coppin's life? Okay, um, so I don't know the full story behind that that image. That I haven't been able to find any more details about, even like a, a caption as to who's who in that picture. Although I could speculate, um, but uh, there is I I am drawn, and maybe other people could share their impressions too. But when I look at that photograph, I'm just so drawn to how awkward the the position of the hands was, uh, and it it. Uh, you know, you had to sit for a while in the 19th century for an exposure to be made, not as long as people think. It wasn't like 10 minutes, but uh, you did have to sit for an uncomfortably long time. So people could could make decisions about where to put their hands. Uh, so it, it makes me think that that particular hand gesture was uh, a little bit maybe perhaps uh, staged, um, but I'm, I am maybe out on a limb there a little bit. Uh, but to Tim, to your other question about um, you know, how much equality was granted to students uh, there during Fannie Jackson's time, um, on the one hand, uh, black students were just as eligible as their white peers to, as I said, pursue degrees, 
live in the, in the dorm, eat in the dining hall, worship in the chapel and so on. Um, but actually the title of my, my book is Degrees of Equality, which is supposed to be like a play on words. So equal access to degrees, but also that there were gradations of what it meant to be equal. So you might go so far as to uh, befriend uh, one of your black classmates is a white person, but other white students might only go so far as to um, uh, acknowledge that they have a right to be there, but might keep their distance from uh, from their black classmates. So there are gradations of this. Um, and I think that we, we oversimplify it when we just say, okay, like integration, everyone's in the same place, problem solved. Uh, it's much more complicated than that. And it has been more complicated than that, um, you know, since, since these early experiments in integration. Um, Yes, other black, notable black women in Oberlin, absolutely. Uh, Anna Julia Cooper is a great example. So one of the early pioneers of the, our, what we talk about now in terms of intersectionality. She was some of the, one of the first people to write about that. Um, you know, uh, Mary Church Terrell, a very active, um, a very strong activist in the uh, earliest iterations of the civil rights movement. Um, I, could, I could go on, but yes, there's a lot of uh, prominent black women that came out of Oberlin in that time period. Um, the uh, the book will be out next year, but it ha I don't have a, a web page for it yet. Uh, so, um, but I can tell you that. Um, let's see, here's the title. Hopefully, I don't change the title by the time you look this up, or by the time it's available. And it's from Louisiana State University Press. Um, did she mention any details about what she did in her free time or for pleasure? She was definitely a workaholic. To be honest, I, I don't know this, but it seems like in reading her husband's memoir that she didn't quite work herself to death, but certainly to exhaustion, um, which is part of the reason she had to come home from Africa early. Um, and she really declined, her health declined pretty rapidly because she was so much of a, uh, a go-getter. I know that she was the type of church woman who did not dance, drink, play cards, anything like that. Um, she was quite, um, quite studious, but she did compose poetry. I know that, that she had, um, a great fondness for music. Um, and then, you know, she just obviously really relished her job as, as a teacher. Um, let's see. Um, so there's a question here about, uh, about racism. Uh, why is some form of racism today, especially seen with recent protests, connected to Oberlin's story and her message to white students and the public? Um, I'm having a little trouble understanding the question, but um, I guess maybe you're asking like, is it is the what's being protested today sort of the same same kind of things as what's being protested or what was being protested then? Um, that's how I interpret the question. Um, I'd say yes and no. There are aspects of racism that you know it's a historical historically constructed constructed phenomenon, uh, and so aspects of it are are quite similar um, to the way that um, the that uh, um, the way that racism has developed over time, um, to the way that um, the bodies of black people are surveilled or policed or exploited and so on. Um, those things have very strong resonances with the slavery era. Uh, on the other hand, the way we talk about race is obviously very different now than it was uh, in the 1860s. Um, in some ways that's for the better. In other ways, in my view, it papers over some of the more real challenges that we have in our society. It becomes an easy out when we suggest that, you know, we've kind of solved the problem or that um, that we can do things in a neutral way because we're somehow more enlightened than our predecessors. It, it, that can be an easy out. So um, that, that's sort of the, the caveat that, that I would have. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I already covered sort of how I, I got interested in researching her just in, in the, the course of researching um, this larger book project. Um, but, uh, but as I said in the talk, I hope you'll go out and research it for yourself. Uh, find this book. Uh, it's easy to find. Reminiscences. Read it for yourself. Uh, um, email me with your thoughts. I'd love that. Um, it's a, uh, you know, it's a remarkable read and it's a very easy, she wrote it to be a very accessible book. She was an extremely well-educated woman, especially for the time, brilliant, but she wrote it to be a really accessible um, read. Um, you know, did she uphold the politics of respectability? Whew, that's a much larger question than <laughs> the cult of womanhood. I guess the short answer is yes, uh, but that those questions about uh, respectability are, are ones that, uh, 
um, are always more complicated. Um, uh, Michael, I, mean, I think we're, we're running lower on time, but Michaela, another student of mine asked, uh, what shocked me the most in my research? Um, I guess I would come back to the, the uh, that, um, how prolific she was. I mean, it's just, it's extraordinary, like that, that she could be, could do so many things uh, and, uh, you know, uh, have such, such energy to pursue all these things um, and, uh, and not give up, you know, can you imagine uh, trying to do all these things even now, but let alone, you know, in an era where, um, you know, where Jim Crow was coalescing, where a black person was being lynched every day in the 1890s on average. Um, you know, this is, she's faced, you know, really incredible odds, but she didn't get up because she had that, that faith, as I said, and that was really um, critical to her whole vision um, and her whole life. Um, so I think maybe that's a good one to, to close on. Priya, what do you think? Sure, um, thank you. Uh, you did mention uh, about the, what was that, uh, women's club in uh, California. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you come across any other instances of, um, you know, her legacy or people mm. referring to her? Um, yeah, um, I haven't come across any cl other clubs by that name, but she's definitely a well-known figure, um, I think, of for women, for black women in particular, who are still, the black women's club movement is still an active thing. Uh, and I think she's a well-known figure in those, uh, in those circles. Um, and certainly among, um, uh, among other, among black educators, I think she's a, she's a, um, is it, her story is, is a familiar one. Um, but, uh, you know, it also helps that the Coppin State University is there kind of carrying on right. that, that legacy too. Yeah. Excellent. So th thank you so much for your enlightening talk today, John. Thank you all very thank much you for your attention. All the great questions. Great questions. People were very engaged. Thank you all for participating. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.